Hello and welcome to the 13th episode of Gretsch Generations. I'm thrilled to be part of this, having been a Gretsch in Dorsey and part of the Gretsch family for ne nearly 20 years, I think maybe over 20 years. That's nearly half my lifetime, would you believe? But so I was very excited to be part of this because I think it's a great thing to bring drummers together from different walks of life, different generations. And I was super thrilled when they told me who the young, talented man was going to be to join me. He's had some big shoes to fill at a very young age. And my God, has he filled them. So are you there, Nick Collins? Going. Yeah, I am. Thanks for the kind words, man. <laughs> Pleasure, mate. I've been practicing that for the last half an hour. <laughs> I, I, I can tell. Yeah, it's, it's really good. You're natural, oh, thank man. You. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. You know, uh, keeping busy in um, a world of no shows, you know? And yeah. You? Well, do you know, when this came about, um, I was talking to everyone at Gretsch, Dave and Jules, and we talked about the collaboration and I didn't realize you'd been to see me play and you didn't realize that I'd been to see you play. I don't think until. No, I had no, yeah, I had no idea. And it, what was funny is I, you know, I knew that uh, Dave from Gretsch was there but I didn't know you were with him at that show. So I, it was, it was yeah. it, when you told me that you were at that gig, I, I had no idea. Well, we sat there and it, by the way, it was a mega show. Honestly, it was unbelievable. And I, I'd never seen you play before. And as I just said uh, on the intro there, it was huge, a huge, um, I know it probably wasn't the start of your career, but I guess at the age, you, you must've been 17 then when I seen you, that was yeah, a something big, like that. That's a big pressure on someone that's just starting out in the big wide world of the music industry. And I, I was impressed with how um, calm and collected you were. You're very composed behind the kit on a mighty drum set as well. Like, <laughs> I couldn't see you from where I was. I could just see the odd symbol going somewhere. Yeah. No, but, I mean, it was, it was, it was, I mean, that gig was so much fun doing that for the two and a half, almost three years that we did do that, um, that tour. And um, for me, I mean, you know, we started rehearsing for that and I was 15 because we had done some kind of pre-rehearsals. And then yeah. by the time the tour started, I was 16 and, you know, took up like, you know, two, three years of my life. You know, every, you could it was yeah, funny right. because you could tell that every single time that dad would introduce me in, in the part of the show, the older I got, the, the quieter the applauses were. You know, it, it wasn't as impressive. It was like my 16 year old, everybody's like, yeah. And it was like my 18 year old. It was like, not as, um, but what was fun is that I got, you know, I got to grow as a drummer on that tour, which was, you know, very much thanks to the, obviously the environment of touring, but also just the, the, the band on, on the road. I mean, great guys, talented yeah. people. And they never made me feel like, you know, out of place. I always felt, you know, comfortable. And well, um, we should give a big shout out because we've both worked with him and he's a wonderful man to Lee Sklar. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's, a, he's an absolute unit. He's a legend. Uh, uh, what I noticed on the gig actually, and, and not, is, not only is he one of the best players in the, bass players in the world, he's got the best beard in the world, he's rec mm -hmm. very recognizable, but I noticed how much fun he was having with you. He was turning, I don't know what he was saying to you, you might, I don't know what he was saying, but you, he was having fun with you and I could tell, tell that he was enjoying it so much. Which yeah, is a, thr a thrill to watch. He's a guy that, you know, I mean, I, I've known him pretty much my whole life. I mean, we've got pictures of me as a toddler on the final farewell tour with my dad and, and you know, me playing with his beard because um, <laughs> he was like Santa Claus to me back then. But, um, <laughs> but no, he's, he's honestly, he's so, he's, he's a great guy and, and what a player. I mean, we, we have some fun when we were on stage. He'd always do this thing. Um, he'd turn around. It was during Dance Into the Light where... It was a pretty straight drum groove, you know, kind of like back and back, just so really straightforward. But there was a part of the song where it was just kind of drums and a bit of a keyboard thing. And he'd look oh. back at me and start clapping on the offbeat and clapping in all sorts of time for really? to try and throw me off. In like oh, a, difficult. Do you know, yeah. he, he's got a great facial expression. I did something with him in Russia with an act called, uh, it was a show called Era. It was a French production and it was basically an instrumental show, but a lot of the tracks started with kind of a drone and he used to just look around at me and go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. we, just, we just ended up laughing about the silliest things. But yeah, big shout out to Lee because he's, he's a wonderful man. And it, I think you couldn't have possibly uh, been on stage with a better guy. For your, I know, for yeah, and as, experience of that, as the drummer and, and him being gig. the bassist, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was great, you know, very enjoyable for me to be able to play with him because, you know, is that kind of thing between a drummer and a bassist where you really have to be locked in together. But yeah. one thing I will say is I've never seen a bassist be requested in so many of the band's monitors ever. You know, really? we, I remember we were playing, um, it was Susudio and the horns went up, they go up at the front of the stage and you're kind of entertaining the audience. 
and he just started this crazy bass fill. And I, George Shelby, our sax player, just turned around and like, you know, the facial expressions he would get from people because he just, you know, pull out the craziest things. But yeah, he's a great guy and, and lots of fun to have on the road as well. So I think, you know, uh, talking about the, the gig itself, I, would, I wanted to ask, did you live with the material? Have you been living with it since you were a boy or did you have to get it together in a short space of time? Well, my, my dad's material on, you know, his solo stuff, um, that was kind of a lot of it was really, um, you know, been in my life since I was a since I was a kid. I mean, I yeah, of course, the early years of my life spent on the road on the final farewell tour. So, you know, a lot of the songs and a lot of the um, even some some of the mannerisms that the band would have during certain songs, you know, the kind of shtick that you kind of have with the audience. Mm. I mean, I was familiar to that. I think it was more um, like with the Genesis stuff, some of the material, obviously, like the hits I knew, but it wasn't until I really started getting into my drumming and, and the more prog side of things that I really, you know, delved into that side of the Genesis music. So when I was preparing for that gig, it was a much different kind of like more of a studious approach as opposed yeah. to um, the solo material, which I kind of really, you know, I knew most of the songs like the back of my hand just from being around yeah. it for so long. You had a lot, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's so many great Phil Collins songs. There's so many great Genesis songs. I hate to think what the set list, how, how, it's so hard to choose a set list, but I thought on the gig, I thought your dynamics, your feel, the sound of the kit. And like I said to you when we were chatting before, the front of house guy was tremendous because yeah. the toms are mic'd from underneath, right? No, actually, they're, they're, they, it depends. But really, for the majority of the tour, they were from the, the top. Really? I thought yeah. they were underneath. Okay, that's interesting. Because they sound... Well, they're very unique sounding, but where, from where I was sat, I could just see these big drums. I didn't know if there was something up on the inside because there was so much depth from each one. Yeah, it was it was brilliant, really great. No, thank you. So, yeah, he's he's great, for, uh, Michelle. He does front of house, and he you know always made it sound like the um, like the record. You know, yeah. it was it was impressive. Well, you you should hold hold your head high and be very proud of that tour because it was um, phenomenal. Is the word I would use. Thank you, man. Phenomenal. I appreciate. I believe it. we've got some messages. Um, coming up on the bottom screen for both of us, if I'm not wrong, which should pop up in a bubble, a bubble, I should say. <laughs> um, and I think, holy moly, great guys here. Okay, so I text. think we're going to get, we're going to get some little things pop up on the bottom of the screen. I think the first question, um, which I, can you see the questions popping up, Nick? No, I, I can't. Why? Well, well, I saw some of the comments, but okay. So the first segment, I believe, is going to be first impressions. Well, for me, on, on, on mine, is, I mean, I was saying, unfortunately, I've never been able to see you play live um, in the flesh, unfortunately. Oh, I'm um, mistaken here. I thought you'd been to a Robbie show, so I have to stand corrected because on the intro I said that we've been to see each other. So I've only been to see you, but you, I thought you'd been to a gig. No, I, 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 I wish I had because the way I, I remember the first time that I'd ever, you know, heard of you is, you know, when you kind of, it was it's that it, to me it's the period of time that every drummer goes through where they just start geeking out about drums and yeah. it, so you're watching every drum kit tour out there and i yeah. and it was the video that you had um that you were walking through the kit um on the robbie I think that tour was 2013 on one of my favorite tours actually take the crown tour that was and it was obviously playing stadiums is, is fun for anybody if you get to do it mm -hmm. but it's just the sheer size of the gig and um that that was i think it's the video of me in the England shirt. They gave us all yeah. an England football shirt, which is... Oh, there it is. is. It's on the screen is... now. Oh, there we go. Are we going to hear this? Or are we just... Stadium, playing here for the fourth night, fourth and final night. And um, just wanted to give you a quick look around the kit again, as we've done before. Yeah, no, that, that, that's... That, I mean, I, I remember watching that. And actually, I you know had a few, uh, whether it was Modern Drummer or Drumhead magazines, and every now and then I'd see your kits and I was like, man, this guy's got real good taste when it comes to drum kits. I, I you know, I well, gotta be honest. I like a kit to look nice, but I, I got a, I got a bit of stick cause I had the double kick for that, for, for that, I do still do for the Robbie show, but it's not set up with double pedals. It's basically to have two different kit sounds like, so I've got two kicks and snares uh, at either side and mm -hmm. it's to go from verse to chorus just for sonics. But a lot of yeah. people thought, I was going to be up there going ticka, 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 and I was like, no, it's not for that. So a lot yeah. of people were like, what, do you, what you got two kicks for? Are you using the other one? I was like, I am. Yeah. I promise you I am. But yeah, my, my setups have always been um, geared up for purely sound. And then if it looks great, then it's an, an absolute bonus. 
So, yeah, no, um, but but really, because I, I knew I was familiar with you from you know knowing that you were doing the Robbie Williams gig, and and then I the more I kind of got into it, I, the more artists I saw that you did. I mean, you know, James Blunt, and um, you did some stuff with Ed Sheeran as well, and even um, I don't know if it was your own band, but the band Feeder that I was, I you know, a, a bunch of videos had started coming up on my YouTube, and it was you know I really dug your playing. It was something for me that I think is like you know what I can really relate to when, in a drummer is when somebody has pocket and groove absolutely know? which you've got in abundance by the way that's that's the first fundamentals for me that are, are important mm-hmm. in when i when i like other drummers i mean my influences as a kid was john bonham jeff Beccaro. um yeah like you say players that just got that deep pocket and are very tasteful and that's why i was so impressed with you because at your, at your age um, i'm guessing you're 18 now uh 19 uh, 19. 19, okay. Yeah. It's still incredibly young. But I, when I was, the only experience, the reason I can relate to the, the sort of experience you had is when I was a boy, I was on the road with my dad's band and uh, they had a drummer, but I was on school, on school holidays, I'd jump on with them and, and go around the UK and it was a UK country band. And one day the drummer was so sick when I was 12 that he couldn't do it. And my, my dad said, you're going to have to step in. And only because I've been on the road with him, I had to step in. And I really felt this nervous pressure of, I knew the tracks, but that gig was worth 100 rehearsals or an experience with an audience. So that's why I take my hat off to what you've, what you've done and achieved so, well, so young and early you. age. It's mega. Yeah. No, I mean yeah. that that the way that gig came about was was it started off with you know some charity gigs here and there you did you do kind of four or five songs and so it wasn't that much and then eventually that led to my dad was kind of thinking about wanting to go back on the road again and because I had done some stuff with him you know at, at a few gigs and we did the U.S. Open um, back in 2016 I think it was um, he asked me if I wanted to do it and and so that's kind of what the first rehearsals that we did when I was 15, we kind of did rehearsals probably around six to eight months before we actually started the tour just to yeah. kind of see how it would go. And, and if I could kind of, I mean, lack of better words, if I could handle it. And, um, and that was great. And yeah, like I said, like the band w- always made me feel, I never felt like I was coming in as, Oh, look, it's, it's Phil's son. And he's just no. here because he's Phil's well, that's son. And the they were always thing. super cool about it. You put your stamp on it, and I, I don't know how uh, with with the, with your dad singing up front. I don't know how um, it, how much he got into what you were playing, or was was intricate, or let you put your stamp on it. But from where I was sat, obviously the kit setup was your choice, I guess. Or did you go for what you needed to have to recreate what was there before? Well, the kit is very, you know, the concert toms and the sizes. It's very much, you know, the it's Phil huge. Collins thing. You know, it's huge, mate. It's the same, uh, mostly same dimensions. You know, a few, um, you know, differences uh, here and there. But really, it was, you know, trying to. I felt like with some of the songs, especially on his solo stuff, is there's so many different drum sounds depending on what album it was on. You know, uh, albums yeah. like No Jacket Required are, are much more. Uh, dancey, sharp kind of drum sound, whereas, um, you know, but seriously is a bit more of a live sound, you know. So the, the kind live of record, the different hats on. Ser- serious hits live record was show me the way, uh, show me the something happened on the way to heaven is mm-hmm. just killer. I think that, that was obviously that was Chester playing on that, wasn't it? Live, yeah, on, and yeah, the serious. There's story, some yeah. great material to get your teeth into, so it must have been a lot of fun. Going back to what you were just saying about, you know. Um, play, playing lots of different styles, if you like, and having good knowledge, which you've had clearly through through your through your, bring, uh, your upbringing. I've had the same, and that's why I've ended up as a session drummer, being able to turn my hand to different styles. Um, as long as I understand the genre, I know how to get the right sound. And then, like you say, the feel and what you play is is the the most important things. Being able to to that, make sure you interpret it on the on the kit, I suppose. Yeah, that was one thing that I noticed because I went through kind of a rabbit hole of, of videos um, when <laughs> I found out that we were going to be doing this. And um, you know, sorry I, about I, that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was uh, no, it was, it was great. But you know, there was the stuff with you know Robbie Williams and James Blunt, and and a very kind of group. And then all of a sudden, you were doing stuff with um, feeder. with feeder, and I'm like, wow, this yeah. is much heavier. And it was kind of the difference between. Um, you know, the, the parts, which is actually kind of what I, I want, I wanted to ask with the, the amount of artists that you've worked with. Um, cause I've kind of had it, you know, well, you know, with, with my band and then Genesis and my dad, but kind of how you approach each artist, like whether you're kind of like, all right, I know that for this gig, this is kind of what I do. And, but when I go and do somebody else, it's going to be different. 
and the kind of even going down to like how you set your kit up and the sizes you use depending on who you're playing for yeah it's a great question over the, when i early on i would usually uh like with james and, and robbie they're very different styles of music but I've, so, I've really got into using the two kicks and the two snares because it's it's a nice thing to have available sonically. But I guess my style stay, stayed the same. The only thing that would change, I think, is tuning. Uh, for uh, you know, it depends on what. It, if a feeder, I'd probably go for sl definitely heavier sticks and slightly heavier crashes, and I definitely my, the velocity would go way up. So there's, it, there's changes, but. I'd like to think that it, I'm still rec it's still recognizable that it's me, if you like. Yeah. And I think. But, sorry, sorry. I, no, I was just no, going to say that, that with James Blunt, you had I think on the video it was uh, a five or six piece band, and I yeah I, that's right. And I didn't know how many people on the on on Robbie Williams' uh, band, so I was kind uh, of wondering on how you kind of fit into your role as the drummer, depending on on yeah, that side it, of things. Well, yeah, you definitely, uh, Robbie Band's a 12 piece. There's a lot more going on. There's brass and uh, we run click track for certain things to, for partly production and to fly in any, any recognizable sample that's needed from a track. Whereas James has always been on wedges and there's no clicks and he likes to push and pull. And we have a sort of mental tempo map that I've learned mm -hmm. to, to, I've learned over the years of playing with him. And I, have, I even sing his lyrics before we start a song to make sure I'm in the right place or watch his foot. <laughs> so they're both very, very different gigs, I guess. Uh, and I, I think with James, less is more is, the, is always the key. And with the Robbie show, when that starts up, it's like Concord starting its engines. It's just, it's, you go off the edge of a cliff and it's, it's, it's crazy. So they're very different, very different beasts, if you like. But I, I approach him. I tried to approach both gigs in the same sort of energetic way, but yeah, just it's a di different mm. thinking cap, I guess. Hey, by the way, we we had my video flash up a minute ago of me, but there's a video of you um, that that that's, uh, we've got that's going to come up now, hopefully on the screen. Oh, that was yeah. That was "Take Me Home." That was the last uh, sh uh, last song of the of the show every night. Which was so the, the reason I asked for this to come up because this is from the tour that I came to see you on. And uh, if anyone didn't see it, it's a real shame. But just looking at look, you can see just from the angle the amount of drums and stuff around you there. <laughs> Where I was sat, honestly, the kit looked absolutely sublime, but. The cymbals were shiny. I said to Dave Phillips, I th that's the ultimate rig. When you go to a gig and you see the kit before, when you see the kit for the first time, it's mega. Because if I'm not right in thinking, the show started with Against All Odds, behind the, Bama Behind the Screen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's one of my favourite tunes, by the way. Yeah, that, that was a real great way to start. Great start to a gig. It was absolutely unreal. And to start with the ballad as well is killer. Well, mm -hmm. you can if you've got, if you've got the ballads, Phil's got, you can, but it, that, that was mega. The, that first, was one... the first Phil, Doof, 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 doof. I was in, I was in straight away. Yeah, no, Fantastic. that was honestly such a great way to, to start off that tour. I mean, because really, you know, not being on the road for so long, um, you know, and, and my dad coming back, it really felt like such a perfect way of 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 starting that, starting the show like that and, and a real kind of vulnerable, you know, and, and, and what I loved about that, that tour is really about the music. I mean, we had great production, but it was so simple that it kind of let the music kind of take on. It, you its didn't own need and, much going on. Cause when that yeah. screen dropped and it literally, it was crystal clear. The definition mm -hmm. was one of the best sounding gigs I've been to actually. And then the other gig that I seen not long after that was Brian Adams. And that was amazing. But let's be honest. Sometimes you can go to a gig and you're looking forward to it and it's disappointing. So oh, absolutely. It, yeah. it, it, where I was sat on the side, um, it, it was mind blowing. I'm really glad, I and I'll definitely come again. That's that's for sure. Let me. The other thing I meant to ask you, because not only you know anyone that's watching this, not, not only is Nick an amazing drummer. You're a musician, and when you came out and played the piano, I had no idea that you were going to play. What was that song called? Remind me. Uh, that you know what I mean. That was a deep cut off of the off of Face Value. That was such a moment in the show, and uh, well, it was very emotional to watch. But uh, I didn't. What else do you play? I can see there's a. Oh well, yeah, no, I, I, I play. I mean, I play guitar um, and and a, a bit of bass, uh, more kind of as writing tools with my band. Um, so basically, know. every everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I mean, listening to um, your band, Better Strangers, this afternoon in the car, 
because I, I just wanted to I wanted to hear what you were doing just to see outside of the, mm -hmm. your, your touring world what what you where you're heading direction and actually I was I was pleased to hear that it was quite rocky and I love the kit sound I was listening to the two tracks I pulled out was Change and Slow, Slow Fade I think there's only three yeah on, but uh, it's great stuff it's really good what's what's the what's you, what's the I know no one can do anything right now but what what are you guys up to what's your plans well well so we um you know this is kind of a continuation of of this band that 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 I formed with um my best friend from middle school um, right. We've kind of gone through a bunch of different uh, iterations of this. And and now this is really at a place where, you know, um, we've got, uh, it's a four piece and our singer um, who joined uh, last year, he's great. And we're really kind of, you know, I wish we could be playing shows. Obviously it's not the world we live in, but we recorded that last summer, the, which is an EP, but obviously Did you right it there now, in that place. In, in no, Miami. no, no. Well, yeah, in Miami, but we have our own studio um a bit further up north um, what, what north, a contrast north. by the way anyone that's watching nick's in miami in the, in the sun <laughs> moaning about mosquitoes i'm here in birmingham solely hall and uh, I'd, I'd slip on my backside if i went out the front door it's that cold <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry you were saying so you recorded it in miami yeah we recorded it and it's you know it the we put out the first three singles to it um which are out everywhere and what I really, I mean, what's been really enjoyable about, about doing that is obviously I'm the drummer of the band and we have yep. a bassist, guitarist and, and our singer, but everybody really puts different hats on when it comes to writing. And, and you're writing really, in that as well. Yeah, we all co-write everything. And that's really why I, you know, try to pick my best picking up the guitar and bass and piano was to Don't be able to write. Don't you think that helps? That helps drumming. If you play, oh, I, mean, I, I play guitar in, enough to write and, but I've been getting into lyrics and I've been doing some writing with Robbie Williams, which has been great, but it really, and, and even singing back in vocals with James, which I do a lot now, thanks to him, he gave me the confidence to sing and, and kind of leans on me to sing, but it makes you play in a certain way and it makes you think about things for sure. Music, it makes you be, you know, very musical. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really just kind of, that, that's really where I, I've always loved doing stuff with my band um, because, you know, I always picture myself like, you know, I, I love the, the technicalities of, 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 you know, certain drummers. It's great. Yeah. But to me, I've always been more wanted to be more of a songwriter in a band where, you know, and, and, and that's why even going to the Genesis gigs, why I love that is because that's to me what those guys are, you know, they're, yeah, they're mean, just immaculate songwriters. So being able to, 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 to participate in that and, and understand more than just the rhythmic side of things has been really great, you know, on, well, do you on, know on our end. Funny, my, my father's a singer and a guitar player. And he brought me up on bands like t um, the Eagles and uh, the band, a lot of dr uh, and obviously Phil Collins. Drummers that sing is is uh, a rarity, and so drummers that play other instruments and can write is it's only healthy for drumming. And I think that kind of carves you out as a drummer, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. and it makes you makes you realise what you love about drumming and where you want drums to fit in the music, if you like. Because yeah. people people ask me, what's your, what, what's your favourite style of music? What do you like to play? And I say, well, if it's a good song, I want to play drums on it. That's how, it, that's yeah. how I feel about music most of the time. Yeah, that's, that's the thing I've really enjoyed about fluctuating between my band, my dad's stuff, and then the Genesis stuff is it's, it's, I mean, obviously my band and the Genesis stuff is a bit more similar as far as, you know, my position as the drummer and, and, and in that sense, but just be able to fluctuate between these different genres and these different, you know, hats that I kind of put on myself as when I play drums and cause you know, back going back to what I had spoken about with the different amount of people on stage and how that affected you. For me, it was, you know, when I played on, uh, on the not dead yet tour, it's like 14, 15 people on stage. So yeah, as the drummer, you, you kind of stay, you know, you do the things that, you know, you, you want to do, but really you, you're the drummer. You've got it. You trying to make rhythmically carry the rest of that band. Yeah. Um, you're the engine room. Exactly. So you kind of really have to stay in this lane of, 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 of being locked in. Whereas with my band and Genesis, because there's less people, obviously yeah. Genesis is, you know, five, you know, four or five musicians. It's, um, you know, there's a lot more space where you can fill up more stuff and, and yeah, a bit more yeah. freedom, if you like. I've, um, got to, I've got to ask you, if you don't want to answer this, you don't have to. What do you think, uh, now having rehearsed with both, what's the toughest play, would you say? 
Uh, it's de- oh, it's definitely the Genesis stuff. I mean, because of the arrangements, right? It's got yeah, to be. it's the it's the time signatures and the arrangements, and but it's honestly something that I've really loved doing. And, and as I've gotten more involved in the in in playing the show, I've really just become even more of a fan of of the band. You know, uh, well, you know, I was listening to them today, and I have a friend, as you know, who's witnessed the rehearsals, and uh, you're apparently are absolutely smashing it, nailing it, as I thought you. you would. But it's so exciting to have that on the horizon because. With what everyone's, what everyone's going through, it's tough for musos right now and anyone that's been doing stuff and uh, has cancelled. And, but at least you've rehearsed the show. Yeah. And you, if, if, if we press go, you're ready, you're ready to go out there and you, you know what's available, if you know what I mean. Yeah, we had some great production rehearsals and it was one of those things, it was a weird thing because we, you know, we had actually rehearsed a few months prior to kind of get the kind of juices flowing and seeing how that would go. But yeah. now that, that we rehearsed again, it was kind of like we finished it, sounded great, show looks great, and it goes, all right, see you guys in eight months or whenever we're doing this. You know, it, mm. it, it's this weird thing of you're so ready to go and, and it just never, you know, yeah. it, the you, world maybe if it's Hopefully it it's not too long. You won't, you won't need – well, you'll probably need a freshener, but at least you've done the hard work. Absolutely. You've got it, you've got it in the tank. We need to get on with some stories because I know me, me and you could talk all day. So we've got – We've been asked, we're going to get a question pop up now about some favorite stories for both of us. I think, well, here we go. So favorite studio moment and track. I'll let you go first. Uh, I mean, you know, as far as the studio, I mean, uh, it's really just been my band that we've been really going, going at it in the studio as far as, because we had a period of time where we were searching for a new singer and that's kind of where the formation right. of Better Strangers came about was when we found this new lineup that, um, that really, that was all, that was all we were doing. It was just all, always in the studio writing. And it sounds great. Who, who produced that stuff? Uh, a good friend of ours. He uh, is called, uh, his name is Jimmy T. That's what he goes by. Um, right. He uh, does a lot of stuff with uh, Dream Theater and and uh, right, a, f- a few other bands. And no, he's great. And we that that whole process of recording that EP, um, you know, was was really awesome. And to be able to, to have him kind of put his take on, um, on the production of it was really something that we, you know, it was, it was lots of fun and being able to finally really kind of sum up this band in the, 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 the you know, the perfect way possible that we could yeah. think of with the production and stuff. Cause sometimes you kind of like, wow, I love this song, but I'm not sure on the production. And this was kind of all the, the production. All my, it, so it all sounds, it all sounds very together all from the same hymn sheet. If you look, the snare drum is incredible, a lot fatter than I expected, but that's mm-hmm. because I've seen you play live on, on a Phil Collins tour. Did they record any of the show? Um, songs for for DVD or was anything the, recorded live? Well, there is there are some live recordings, but I you know um, I'm not sure on what the plans are for the Not Dead Yet tour. I mean, I I have them on my computer, so <laughs> <laughs> well that counts. That counts as recordings. Well, my my situation with recording, you know, I was looking because somebody asked me to do a little Instagram thing the other day and pick out some tracks and play on. It's hard to pick a favorite moment in the studio because. I've been very fortunate over the years. I mean, I'm I'm twice your age, as you can see, and I've had a really I've had some real fortunate calls and producers that have have liked what I do and what I what I sound like and how I, what I create. I think in the studio, which is key. I think if you mm-hmm. if you're a studio drummer, you've got to be able to get a great sound and you've got to be able to have your own initiative and offer things and not be dictated to if you left your own devices. So to pick a track out of my favourite moment. Um, I guess favourite moment was um, it's a producer I've worked with a lot called Steve Robson, and I think I really wanted to impress him because he's, he's he's big news. He's done a lot of stuff, and he's now a dear friend. And um, when I went into the studio to work for Steve, it was my, I felt like an audition, and I walked away and I'd done the track, and I thought oh, I hope he calls again. I really you know sort of checked my mm-hmm. phone a few times the next day, and uh, not, I, I don't think he called me back bastard but um no he did he did call me for the next session he didn't text me or anything to sort of uh, say it was how good it was but he called me from then on and i've worked with him for many years so after all the, the albums and bits and bobs i've done i've done some really really great stuff with robbie and james and i feel very grateful but i picked out a charity single that i did for uh, help for haiti which went to i think it went to number one and that was produced by steve robson and john shanks and the reason that was great is because of the cause and also because um, the amount of different artists that were on this record, once I'd laid the kit down and I li- looked back and listened to who was on it, I thought, wow, my CV's just gone through the roof, <laughs> even though they were singing like little uh, paragraphs each. But there was like uh, bon jo- John Bon Jovi was on there, Mariah Carey, James Blunt and Robbie were on it, uh, Rod Stewart. It was a, it was a, a mega uh, moment. And also 
the key thing about that, which, which you can relate to, is they, they both produced... They, Steve wanted me to nail the drum parts from the original REM record, which it's not necessarily how I would play or tune my kit, so I found that a challenge because I couldn't go in and just be me. I, I went in and had to listen to the parts, and he plays it like a real band drum, and it's very unique drum part. So it was a challenge and memorable for that reason. So that's, that's what I'd have to use as my, uh, my favourite story moment. <laughs> no, that's awesome. What I'm about just, live? Live? Oh, gosh. Um, am I allowed to have two for live? Have as many as you want, man. Okay. <laughs> well, I've got my favourite notable performance. I think there's, there's definitely two. My first one, when you, when you start with an artist from the ground and work upwards, which was James Blunt, I met James in a cafe uh, in Parsons Green in London, and I'd done a few... Um, promo things with Elton John at the time, just like TV shows and whatnot. And Elton was something to do with James, so recommended me to James. So I just met James in a calf. He wanted to know what I was like. And we started doing really small gigs to 50 people. Before you knew it, he was doing the Elton John support. Before you knew it, it was number one. And we did Glastonbury. And I remember as a unit, as a bunch of guys that lived on a tour bus and were experiencing this roller coaster, he was really nervous. He won't mind me saying that. And so was the rest of us. And the lineup that day was... This is incredible. I think it was Shaken Stevens first, and then it was the Raconteurs, James Blunt, Amy Winehouse, Jay Z. It was wow. It was a heavy, a heavy, a great memorable day. But I just remember going up there and seeing all the flags at Glastonbury and thinking, "Wow, this is incredible!" You know, I've arrived. And um, <laughs> when we came off, I have to say we got really drunk and stayed there. Well, but right watch so. that Jay Z performance and Amy Winehouse was. Uh, very, I mean, it's got to have gone down as one of the best lineups that day. So that's that's one. The other one would be, I do, I don't know about you, but I like, I do like a pressure moment. I like to, when I get on the kit, I like that. I like the fact that it's my job to drive the band mm -hmm. and be a perfectionist and and you know everyone makes mistakes, but just give it 110. percent So the gig that I did with Robbie in Estonia on the Take the Crown tour, which is when you seen that setup. That was filmed and there was helicopters hovering and it went out to something like 45 countries in cinemas. Wow. So that it was quite a pressure. And the reason I love this is because my young boy went to watch it with my father at the local cinema here in Soli Hall and uh, called me after and was just sort of blown away. So I think it was the, the, the sheer size of the gig and the pressure and the occasion was the, probably the most memorable gig for that, for that reason. And uh, my little boy first capturing his dad doing his thing was quite nice as well. That's so awesome. That's my two yeah. my two stories. You must have a you must have a bucket load. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like I, I mean, there's so many, you know, more than I can think of on the Not Dead Yet tour, just simply because it was so long. You know, we we did so many different, uh, we did pretty much every continent, um, a, apart from you know Africa and Asia. But, Where was the first know, show? The first show that you the did. First show was in Liverpool. And that was one of them where I remember we we had gotten together and, you know, my dad wasn't sold on, he wanted to be on the road, but he wasn't there where he's like, you know, this is, I want to, you know, because he's getting at a point in his life where, you know, he'd rather sit home and, and watch some football, you know, rather than, than, than you know, <laughs> being wherever in Europe, you know. Um, Who's his team, by the way? Uh, we're both Manchester United fans. I I didn't okay. I didn't know you were both on on the side. So you you were having a good time at the moment. You're enjoying it. Exactly. Yes. Uh, you know, not you know, different to the last seven years. But anyways, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, at least we'll get onto that. <laughs> but um, no. But so the, that first show actually was this. We had never actually rehearsed the, the set start to finish, right? At all. You know, we had done it bits what, and how pieces. Come? Well, it's just, um, it was the kind of thing where we'd done bits and pieces and then, you know, we'd get to the end and it, we didn't want to do the encores just because my dad's like, I want to save my voice. Fair enough. And, and that keeps going. And all of a sudden we're like, we've never done this set. And, um, <laughs> and my dad has had a real history in, in, in England of always getting completely slaughtered in, in the reviews. Uh, they just, yeah, yeah, well. yeah, you know, throughout the years. And that first show was one of the best reviews he's ever gotten. Kind of Phoenix rises from the ashes and his first show Amazing. by himself in, in, you know, however many years it had been. And it was such a feeling of kind of like, you know, kind of we've done it. But I would also yeah. say just touring in South America, that was such a fantastic experience. And those, those stadiums and the fans there are just it's unlike anywhere else. Isn't it? It's another level of um, excitement and yeah. 
I, I did that James Blunt talk we were talking about. Um, we supported Elton John across South America in the football stadiums, and you, can, you can't hear, you can barely hear the wedges. It was yeah. just. I think uh, Dave Phillips told me a, a great, a great uh, story about Matt Sorum when he's got the Guns and Roses gig, and he came out and started the whole show, and it's in South America, and just started on hats by himself, and the noise that must have been some feeling. It gives me goose pimples thinking about it. Yeah, but it's, I it guess was... that's. I asked you where the first show was because I wanted to say to you. I know you, you uh, South America was the most notable. But how did you feel then with the first show in Liverpool without running the whole set? Because I have a sense of um, completion. When I've run a whole set back to front, I, uh, back, not back to front, from start to finish, um, I have a, a sense of just what sticks you're picking up and things you're doing in between. Mm -hmm. And so it, that must have put a bit of an extra yeah, spin on it for it you. Was, it, was, it was, I mean, you know, when we finished it, it was like, wow. Like, you know, I, I remember going up there and, and the nerves because, I, you know, I'd never done yeah. a show of that magnitude in an arena uh, at the time. And so the nerves were really there. Um, you know, you're, the, the sweaty palms and everything. But as soon as that happened, as soon as that show finished, we were like, yeah, you know, cruise control uh, through the rest of the, of, of, of the shows. I mean, um, every place we've done has been great. And what's been really awesome is seeing the different, um, you know, the different types of, of, of audiences you get, depending on where yeah, you go. I mean, yeah, you go to, go to so England, different. you have a much more reserved uh, audience. Same thing with Australia, I feel. But then yep. you go to South America and it's like, you know, Absolute how was Birmingham for you? <laughs> the, 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 honestly, that oh, no, sorry Birmingham, but sometimes Birmingham can be very sort of reserved and sort yeah. of hard to um, hard to win over, shall we say? Well, that's one of those things that you you know I always judge one of our shows if it was a good or bad show. Is we you know we would kind of get to the the latter stages of the show, um, yeah. probably like the last third of it, and it's kind of the home stretch. And if they don't stand up in you know by that point i'm like all right this show is is not hitting it for them clearly but we never you know we never had that which was good and i don't re really recall any show being like wow that audience sucked i can't you know, imagine good. that show not not hitting at home with anybody but i i um i appreciate your honesty with the nerves thing because mm -hmm. um again you know being a young a young man experiencing arenas for the first time that's that's something in itself before you even think about nailing the tracks and um you know, playing behind a megastar like your dad. And I, I, I was 17 when I did my first arena tour and I was petrified. It was Cardiff Arena and I was absolutely petrified. I, I, I don't know how I got through it, but once I got through it, I, I was still nervous for the second one, but it took me that tour to kind of find myself and uh, get over that nervous feeling. A lot of it was, back then was to do with click track and technology. And I was just, it's just a bit of self-doubt creeping in when you see, when you see the crowd and stuff because you just don't want to let anybody down. But that's yeah. why I, I take my hat off to you for what what you what you stepped into there. And honestly, me and Dave were blown away. It was you were so composed. You looked like you'd been doing it for ten Thank years, you. but that wouldn't be possible. <laughs> no, but honestly, it's, it's it was you know the different the kind of nervousness depending on on the on different people I've done gigs for. I mean, my band. Mm. The nervousness doesn't so much stem from the playing. It's more from, you know, this is my group. You know, we're yes. all in this band together. It's, it's a different us, dynamic. You know, and it's like, I've, it's not like I get to full, you know, in other words, like I, on my dad's gig is I'm, I'm just playing drums. You know, yeah. I'm playing drums to songs that have sold X amount of, you know, uh, copies. And that's what I'm doing. Whereas with my band, it's like, I'm, you're going to prove that. Like, I know you like my dad, but check this out too. You know what I mean? Yes. And, um, yeah. And then where the Genesis thing, it's just filling in those shoes and, you know, trying to... Are you using the same setup on Genesis as you're using, that you use on uh, Phil Collins' tour? Uh, pretty much. Uh, a bigger kick drum and a few more cymbals and bits and bobs Do you know what I was going to say? that Because the kick's a 20, isn't it? Yeah, on my dad's tour, it was a 20-inch, which on, honestly, I, we had so many subs and... and uh, the Didn't feel the difference. Porter and Davies thrown that, you know, it was, yeah. I, it was, it was all fine. But on, on the Genesis one, I thought it could use a bit more on the, on the kick so it's it's a 22 and it, it's, it's relatively deep it's 18 inches deep but the, with my band i use a 24 kick and, and much more bottom size drums you know double headed nice. um well I, th I think later on on the chat we'll go th we can go through each other's kit setup but what we're just, just talking about pressure and gigs and everything there's a question that's going to pop up now about our biggest oops moment now um you you can go first this time or i can i don't mind but um, no i i honestly you know there's there's a few times where, you know, during the gig, you're like, oh, that didn't go. Not so much 
It's it's always more on the technical side, and I. But I, I I'd out. imagine you're your worst critic because your your execution is is brilliant, and I you, it, I it, I couldn't hear. I didn't hear anything wrong on the gig. I think you said to me the other day, you, 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 everyone makes the odd mistake, but it might not be a, a blatant mistake that anyone's going to notice. Yeah. It might be just the way you execute Phil or the the, the, the velocity or something. So, Yeah, we, um, I, I didn't have too many hiccups on the drumming side of, of things just because also I think what's so important for uh, drummers to, to just... I think it's even sometimes more, you know, just as important as the playing is if you do mess up, how are you going to come out of that mess up to make it seem like you didn't actually mess up? You know? Do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I meant to do well, it. Well, if you do mess up, the best thing to do is blame Lee because exactly. he's trying to put you off all the time. Exactly. No, but honestly, the biggest oops moment I had, and I, I wasn't sure if it was actually at the show that you went to, but I actually think it was in Newcastle. Um, right. Like when you had mentioned, there's a you know, piece of, uh, bit of the show where I went down and played a song on piano. And um, that was a real, I mean, it was a lovely moment in the show. And, and, but obviously when I'm kind of, when I play drums, I get to, you know, I have this kind of shield of stuff in front of me. And yeah. I know that if I, if I am going to hiccup, I know that I have a way to kind of recover with piano. It's not my first instrument. And so if I mess up, that's kind of it. I'm really based off muscle memory and stuff. So okay. the way we played that song is, um, I learned it in the original key and we lowered it uh, a half step, but obviously I'm a drummer. I'm like, just transpose the keyboard half a step and I'll, I'll play it like that. Yeah. And I got down to the keyboard and, you know, dad spoke, introduced the song, introduced why we're doing it. And anyway, as soon as I hit that first note, I was like, something's wrong. Something's no. wrong with this keyboard. And basically what had happened um, was that, you know, I don't know if it was some one of the one of the people on the, one of the people on the crew or something, but the you know the keyboard had been split, where half of the keyboard was my transposed piano, and the other one was a normal standard key, like upright bass or something. So I was hearing this like dissonance of uh, you know, and 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 I was like trying to improvise to try and go higher and play the 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 stuff an octave up, and I just we got halfway through the song. I looked at my dad and I went. I went, I can't do this. I stopped. I'm like, this, I, I really, I'm like, I'm, I was like sweating. So I'm like, that's, I'm that's quite like, cool, actually, that you chose to stop because I think sometimes if something's hideous and wrong with YouTube and whatnot and people filming that, if you carry on and something's not right, it just goes out. It's out there for the yeah. rest the rest of the world to but, see for it. So you were right to stop. And I hope well, you made fun of it because everyone makes mistakes. Yeah, that I happens. made fun of it. And, I, and it was funny because I was like, I, I said it and you kind of picked it up in the mic. I went, you know, dad, keyboards effed up. I, I, right. I really but the thing with that is I was so bummed for the rest of that show because I couldn't it shake was, it off. It was like, I couldn't shake it off. And I also knew that everybody in that audience, they were like, the keyboard didn't mess up. That's an excuse that I, uh, if I've ever heard one, you know, I was like, but um, no, it was fine. And, well, and honestly, I make a joke about it now. Every now and then, sometimes we'd play that bit and I'd hit a jazz note or two. And, um, <laughs> you know, you know, it's an experience. It's good to make mistakes, to realize, to, to work out how you recover from them really, because I, I, you know, I think making making mistakes is horrible. I'm the same. I made one when I was very young on my first arena tour, and I, I lived with it for a week. And I think it, it definitely happens. But I, I sometimes use football examples when you first start, when you get to play a gig. I was trying to say to myself, just keep it simple. Get through the first three songs. Like if you go out to play football, just keep the ball. Don't give it away. Just just do the simple thing. And if you do make a mistake, that the recovery time is difficult and. This brings me to the oops moment I had. I'm not, I don't doubt myself and worry about making mistakes too much because I'm quite, once I'm up there, my concentration level's good and performing is what I enjoy. So um, I, 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 don't like, I don't like wearing, having to mm -hmm. get over a mistake. So I try my best not to. But uh, this is horrendous, by the way. I don't know if I've ever told this story, but we rehearsed for weeks on end, months, and we went to do the first show in Manchester, the Robbie Heavy Entertainment Show. And by the way, I'm, a no, uh, I'm, I'm blaming nobody for this. It was a total misunderstanding. So um, all the bands in ears go to the dressing room and uh, mine normally stay in the kit. And there was some, there was some mix up between me and what I'd said and someone else. So the, the walk to the stage is a long way. And uh, the, the short version of this is the, the intro started and I can't find me in ears. On oh the my stage. God. And this is what I say, it, it, sometimes technology scares me because if you've got no ears on stage with Robbie, all you hear is the brass <laughs> and a yeah. load of people screaming. So 
the song started it and it had an intro and I managed to get word to my tech who's on the side, who was great and he was dumbfounded. And then by the time the spares came up, it was t I had to come in. So I said to the bass player and thanks Jerry Meehan so much. Jerry, he wears this big hat and uh, he's got such a great image. So he said, I've got the click. I'm going to nod in time and you just got to stay with me until you get your ears in. <laughs> so wow. it was horrible because my heart, honestly, uh, my heart was in my mouth. I knew it was the first show and there's lots of people there. So basically I got, it was for, um, it, luckily it wasn't Let Me Entertain You. It was a track called The Heavy Entertainment Show. Had it been Let Me Entertain You, it would have been hard to hang on. Yeah. But I managed to do it and I managed to get the ears in just for the intro of uh, Let Me Entertain You. That's funny. But it was such a learning uh, experience. But the thing is, relating to what you just said, I couldn't shake it off for six songs because uh, I was mad with myself. I didn't know how it happened. Mm -hmm. Of course, these things happen and it's possible. And no, it, it was just a, a basic misunderstanding with a bit of technology. And um, I didn't know how it had come across out front. I didn't know if people could tell it was a mistake and they were thinking, what the hell was, what was Carl doing on the first song up there? That sounded horrendous. So I was just, and when someone looks at you on stage and goes, and looks, Guy Chambers looks at me and went, are you okay? I thought, oh, that must, it must have been terrible. <laughs> so yeah. I spun out for a minute, but that was, that was, um, that was a bad experience. But you know what? We got through it. And if you're at that show, I'm sorry, but um, the other, the other notable thing, I've got to tell you this story if I've got time. We're not taking up too much time. Basically, I did a, a James Blunt show in um, Chicago, and he was just breaking it in the States. And he likes to do this thing where we do a slide track, and he jumps off the stage into the pit. So he jumps off, and all the security are facing the audience. So he jumps off, the security turned around and thought he was someone out the pit. So two security rugby tackled James Blunt to the floor. <laughs> Oh my God. Well, and we're all, I'm just playing the kick drum, watching him wrestle with a load of people under the spotlight. So I wanted to, I wanted to tell that story because it's really funny That's and awesome. it's, uh, funny. it's not such a negative one. But yeah, if, if, he's, if he's listening, I'm sorry, James, but that was uh, one that will stay with me for. I couldn't play the kick for laughing. <laughs> I, I bet. I mean, you know, I mean, because going back to what you said about concentration of when you kind of shake off a mistake is I always tried to keep that when, when we were doing the Not Dead Yet tour. Um, yeah you know, really trying to, but there were some songs I remember, you know, some songs are on autopilot. I mean, we, we, oh, yeah. we do can't hurry love at one part in the show and that's just, you know, a oh. Motown kind of groove and it's the same right thing grooved. over and over again. And, and eventually I go, I don't know what chorus we're at. I go, this song could be ending next, the next bar, or we could have another verse to go. And yeah. you, you know, you start to, but there was a one time where we don't use, well, we don't use a click on the, for the whole band on the, on any of the tours, the, Clearly, I meant to I, ask you that. That's good. To I start some songs with a click by myself, so I kind of, you know, sometimes just you, a reference. You, exactly. You don't want to start yeah. the song too fast or too slow. But really, a good thing that I've enjoyed about both my dad's stuff and the Genesis stuff is the amount of drum loops that there are. Drum machine, you know that, you know, songs like Mama, songs like in, even in the air, like that yeah. is kind of that is my uh, that is my click track, and I actually really I, I enjoy playing to those much more than just a regular click. Yeah. But we were doing uh, throwing it all away at a. Actually, I remember it was in, um, I think it could have been Nijmegen, which is... These, tra uh, these tracks you keep throwing out, I mean, it, every track is just a dream to play. <laughs> no, it, it, sorry, you were saying. No, we, we, it was in, ne in the Netherlands and it was a big open air um, kind of festival vibe. And um, I'm, you know, I've got those drum loops pumped in my ears because I really need to stay on it. And all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. Drum loop was not in my ears anymore. Oh, and no. I don't know where it went. And I, and it, you could tell it would like, it happened to some of the band members. Cause I'm looking and I'm like, I can't hear the click mouthing to Daryl and Leland. Like, and so I had to take an ear off and kind of get a slapped back version of the, of the loop from the front of house and try to kind of play before it. It yeah. only, I only have to deal with that for about, you know, 16 bars. And then it came back. But no, no fun at all. When that happens, it's no, just, yeah. it's, it, 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 I'm sure. I'm sure we must lose hours of um, repair time when, you, when that happens because it it it, it really is that sickening stomach that sickening stomach feeling mm -hmm. you get because you just don't know where it's going or where it's going to head. So yeah. I think rec uh, trying to recover from a mistake is worse than making a mistake. I think. <laughs> exactly. I want to ask you quick before we move on. Um, what's your favourite film song to play live? Because there's so many great ones. I mean, Craig. I mean, I've got one. If I was in your shoes, I think. I, 
Easy Lover would be my favourite to play. Yeah, Easy Lover was always a lot of fun. I think, honestly, I always used to like playing the song that we would just add on that leg. Um, you know, there was when we did uh, the, the last few legs, we, we added Don't Lose My Number, um, which yeah. we hadn't done on the first few. And, and that was always a highlight because it's, you know, something fresh. But songs like Easy Lover were always fun. Su Studio was fun because I right. honestly, with songs like Su Studio, I've never had so much fun just playing four on the floor, yeah. you know. Just going oh, like that. Drum, it, was, it was so much fun. Drum sound out front was ridiculous. I mean, if any drummers watching haven't been to the gig, we'll get into kits and all that later, but it's such a good gig to go and experience this great drum sound and great drum parts, of course. It oh, really thank is. You. Yeah, we, it was we've, awesome um, show. we've got uh, another question to pop up now, which is going to be, what are we practising right now? Um, so, well, I'm practising guitar. <laughs> 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 uh, if, if I'm honest about... Drums. Um, my last my last sessions were before before the, uh, before Christmas, and I had a whole busy period. With Robbie doing a December sort of Christmas promo, which I was part of um, the Christmas. The, being part of this Christmas promo was great because I happened to co-write the single with him and a good friend of mine, Owen and uh, and Ben, and it was fun promoting that song. So there was a fair bit of playing over Christmas. So I, I've enjoyed a bit of the rest, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, be before that, I was doing some stuff with feeders. So I, I kind of, when I do get a respite, I think it's good to take it for a bit. I'm not, if I'm brute, you know, really honest, I'm not one of those that would get up with a pad every day because it's the same. Me it doesn't, le it doesn't leave me, and I don't mean that to sound big-headed or anything. But my sometimes just having a break from anything does you the world of good. And when I go back to the kit, um, you know, I'll I'll make sure my sound is good, and I'll brush up on things and make sure the muscles are working and do the things I like to do, but. Um, I'm not sitting around practicing trying to get amazing new chops off every day, if I'm yeah. honest. I'm just no. happy to be, be well oiled and, and be playing when I can. Yeah, the way I've always kind of seen it is obviously, you know, I have my pad stuff and, you know, the rudiments every now and then. That's really how more I use those more when I warm up for a, a gig, you know, that, you know, I'm going through an hour of just kind of really getting the muscles going and the, and the mind going with different uh, rudiments and polyrhythms, but by myself, it's like, I'll play, you know, when I, when I go to, cause right now, um, obviously I'm keeping the Genesis material fresh in my mind. Um, yes. and also doing just my band stuff. I mean, we, we get together all the time and we're writing and rehearsing. And so when I get to the kit there, that's when I kind of, you know, get to, you know, refine my, my chops, if you will. Well, look um, at how much you've rehearsed. You've rehearsed so much with, with Genesis and, and been doing things with your band that sometimes you need, you need that bit of breather because rehearsals are pretty intense. Yeah. And that is a kind of a way of keeping yourself uh, up to speed and, and learning new things. The amount of new material you've had to learn, I think, I think it's fair to say you've, you've practised and popped pigeoned it all into a small space if yeah. you like well you know I mean, when we were kind of when i was rehearsing for all this genesis stuff uh before we did the initial rehearsals uh early last year you know i was i was also kind of you know getting into certain um you know lots of more studious things and 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 latin polyrhythms and and what that and all that stuff and i i just kind of went you know what i've got you know I've got certain songs to worry about, but I'm not interested yeah. in this. I'm I mean, like... saying that when you get a solo, by the way, I watched that um, one of your solos today, um, which is phenomenal. I, I think that's where we've, we all need our little little uh, chops in the locker to do mm -hmm. solos and pull out some, some nice little bits and bobs that suits your character of playing, if you like. So mm -hmm. it's good. I, I definitely have a practice pad backstage at the gigs. When I'm on tour and I'm in music mode, great. But if I'm at home, it's just not... So I don't mean to say negative, saying I'm not practicing or anything, but I've been, I've been writing. I've put a little band together in Birmingham, but I think there's different pockets of fun to have. Like you say, mm -hmm. you've got your studio, and I guess your band takes up a lot of your time. Yeah, well, yeah, that's. I mean, you know, half the time when I do get, you know, we, we spend the whole day at the studio. The last thing you want to do when you get home is practice or to, you know do music related so so really when I'm by myself and I'm not in that band setting as the drummer, I actually like more kind of you know whether it's playing guitar or piano or you know experimenting with uh drum machines and stuff like it, it it's just different for me and something i enjoy doing so it's not all drums 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 if you know yeah. if that makes sense well yeah I, i'm the same and i you know i feel i always feel guilty saying i don't practice so much but when i if i do have a break i find when i go back to the kit i feel refreshed especially mm -hmm. if i'm creating drum parts and creating new things i feel because there's definitely been times where 
I've played that much. I'm like, oh, I need it. I just need a. My brain needs a break to create stuff. Uh, yeah, if, even if, when so you're if, writing, I mean, it's 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 like you're know, like, I did. I've done this on the last three songs. Like, I, you know, yeah. you, need a, you need a time away, and it, even even if it's listening to a you know some random artist, and you go, oh, that's their take on on their drum parts, and it you know just something to kind of keep it fresh. Really. Do you ever find yourself doing? the same sort of feel or going hold on a minute I've, I've i've got to i've got to recycle i can't keep using the same yeah i mean it, it's not so much of like the groove but like well, the other day it, it happened to me and i was like i was like guys i'm tired of of doing my my verses on the hi-hat loosen up the hi-hat and then you go to the crash i'm like i need yeah. to do something else and you know and 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 so going and listening to different um artists to me at least sometimes it helps because it's like Right. You don't, you know, sometimes you get really locked into a formula of how you play and how you write and how you contribute yeah. to writing songs. And I think breaking from that is so important. It, it depends what the band, what, what you want it to be as well, I guess, because if I, if I go and record, say, with, with James or it, a Passenger, I've just done a new album. Basically, with the Passenger, I've done, I've done what it says on the tin. I've played just the song, how it should be. If I go in with Feeder, I know. Uh, Grant will want some more adventurous takes and different ideas, not just necessarily two and four. He mm -hmm. wants to do stuff that will that make you think a little bit. So I, I just I just do things in the try to put things the energy in the right places. If you know what I mean. Absolutely. I get, but with your own band, that's that's a tough job. It's quite it's mentally exhausting creating parts and, yeah. and then deciding what ones you're going to use. Yeah. Christ, you imagine, imagine what it's like in the Genesis writing days. There must have been like, well, what what parts are we going to use? I know that's you know. <laughs> Is but, but what's funny is I remember when we were going with my band when we were going through the period of time where we didn't have a singer is you start writing songs like you know you you can tell this band doesn't have a singer you start yeah. doing stupid time signatures and and parts that are <laughs> you know no place for a vocal and then when all of a sudden when we did get our singer and we were writing and it's like you know you get to there's so much more space because you're like oh there's a vocal now I don't have to compensate for there not being a vocal you know. Yeah, um, but yeah. But do, you, do you know? Um, I was going to say I don't know how it can, but it, it can link to our next question. But how did you first find Gretsch, and what was your first Gretsch kit? Well, my first Gretsch. Well, honestly, Gretsch has kind of been around my life for ages because of my dad, and you know he's a long time Gretsch um, Gretsch Course. player. I mean, so. Because I mean, you could have, you know, you could have decided. To, lots of drummers have different tastes in kits and stuff. So, would your first kit have been one he passed on to you then? No, the first. Well, the first. Obviously, when I was a little toddler, it was, you know, whatever kind of. Uh, I think it may have been like a, a really kind of, beginner level like Mapex kit or something. But my first Gretsch kit, I must have been about four or five, um, and I, I think they have. There's some pictures of it. Yeah, there it is. It's oh, wow. uh, it was it was a little uh, Catalina. I think it was a Catalina club kit with that kind of gray sparkle. I love the and two splashes up on the left. I know <laughs> it was, it, and it was that was. I still have um, pretty much all of those drums uh, left. You do, and and yeah, I I still do. I, I have them at the studio, but really, I after that kit, obviously, I I got older and and I needed um, bigger drums and. Um, I went through a few different, uh, you know, different drum sets and different companies. But honestly, when, when I went back to, to to really using Gretsch, it really stemmed from using that concert tom kit. And then I started really getting yeah. into John Bonham and all that. So I started getting double. You headed. found the Gretsch sound. It's, I should probably. Uh, it's a stupid question. And what I should have should have said is what made you stick with Gretsch? Because I'm guessing it was Gretsch kits you were surrounded by. The great yeah, on, sound on, at an early age. It, well, the first thing was the sound, and it was the look, and it was just like. There was something that I, you know, and obviously it's going to sound like we're kind of here brown nose and Gretsch because we're on their live stream. But really, I'm, I'm being really honest that it was when I played Gretsch drums, that's, it was something that I, I enjoyed playing the drums so much more when I was playing um, Gretsch than when I was playing any other drum company. And also, yeah. to me, it's the versatility that I've been able to have with Gretsch is like on the Genesis stuff, I use a, uh, you know, concert tom kit. Yeah. Um, and it's a specific setup, but then with my band, it's much more bottom size, you know, 14 inch rack tom, 16 and 18. Well, like and we talked about before, I, I, I'm, I've had to put different, uh, have a different sound and be, be, ha be able to recreate different drum sounds in the studio and live with artists that have got a vast, um, different sound compared to each other. And, um, 
what I have found is I can make I can have one I could make the broadcaster kit do the do it mm -hmm. do that thing for every artist. But my my favourite kit at the moment is the Brooklyn. It just I used it for the swing stuff with Robbie, and I just really enjoyed the sound of it. Um, at the, at the tone of the kit, I found it easy to tune with the certain heads that I use, and uh, it's kind of a comfort black kit now. I just I, mm -hmm. um, that's I know I know what I love. My, my first kit was a Catalina as well, believe it or not. I think there's a horrendous picture to go with this. There you go. I love the hair, man. Oh, it's ridiculous. But anyway, I. I, uh, that kit, if you look at it, it's a 26 bass drum. I was about to say, that kick drum looks massive. Yeah, I looked, I looked tiny, but it's a 26 kick, a 14 rack, and an eight, 16 and 18 floor, I think. And it was, it was a great starting kit for me. I and mean, I've, I've been with Gretsch for over, I think it's over 20 years. And the fir the fir that first kit there was what was given to me, and I, just, I made it work, and it was for the James, the James Blunt gig. And uh, I quickly found that the 26 was probably being a bit adventurous for tuning. The front mm -hmm. of house guy would say, look, it just sounds like a, a wave crashing into the, into the rocks out there. He said, I can't do much with it. So that I, I moved on in the end. But Gretsch have been extremely generous to me, supportive. Their roster has gone through the roof over the years yeah. for, for, you know, the, for, uh, for the, main, the main reason that they're the best sounding drums with great heritage. So... I was lucky enough to do the Gretsch advert a few a uh, few years ago. I think it might be. Three I saw. Or four, I saw it. I, I think. But I remember you did something with the Brooklyn kit, and I went, "Man, he's making every Gretsch drum line. You know, he's well, making me want to get more and more kits." It was great. Guy. But when, when I got there, uh, the Gretsch factory uh, is is uh, very old school, and uh, it was very hot in there. And if you remember, I was wearing a suit. And so literally, Andrew Shreve will, will remember this well, but I'd be playing for like 30 seconds and I'd be just soaking. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be soaking, but it was such a memorable experience because I flew in, I was a little bit jet lagged and I had to play. And of course, Sydney Blackman was there, Stanton Moore. Everyone was mm. rocking and sounded amazing, looked sharp. And then we had some great chicken, but I got to meet all the Gretsch staff and the people that manufacture and make these drums every day. And Paul Cooper, who runs the show, um, it runs the factory there. They, they were so lovely, and it just made me it made me even more um, honoured to be part of the team. And I, I met Fred Gretsch as well. So there's a lot of great history there, and uh, we were, I feel really lucky to be part of the family. And I think it's fair to say the drums, the drums, the, the, what's available to us as drummers is it, it, amazing. And I've found what really works for me now. So yeah. it's. Uh, well, that was one thing with me with with Gretsch, which you know, kind of like what you mentioned. I remember, you know, when I. I wanted a new kit and I wanted, I, I was getting really specific with what I wanted within this kit. And I remember we, I think it must have been, I think it was in LA we were, before one of the shows and Andrew Shreve came out. And I remember sitting with Andrew going through every detail of the size. And because it was, you know, I, I wanted a 14 by 11, you know, 11 by 14. <laughs> I didn't want a 10, I wanted it, you know, all this, all these stupid sizes. Um, and, and, but I, you know, and, and there was never any issue um i wanted the concert toms you know two high concert toms that i wanted and and they've always been so cool about it and always you know so open to requests and and, and you know the kit that i'm using now which i think will have some pictures of our current setups now it you know the, the, i don't the know how they deal with the request because the factory's not huge but there's a, there's a great production line and it's um that they're very efficient over there but if you think about the amount of drummers that are requesting different setups and the, the turnover it, it's crazy when you go there and see it, which you should one day um it'll warm your heart because i just couldn't i couldn't believe it it's uh it's such a unique place to go but uh, I think next time I'd rather play in a vest and some pants than a, than a suit. <laughs> but so what the kit you're using on the tour now is, uh, let's say, um, let's go with Phil Collins' tour, is a USA Custom, right? Yeah, it's a USA Custom uh, concert tom kit. It was kind of similar to the one that I'm using with, that I used with him and with Genesis. I don't know if, there it is. Oh, wow. And, Keep that uh, picture up there for a bit because there's a lot of detail to look at there. Yeah, Let it's... Sorry, wow. go ahead. I was just it's, gonna say, so that's, you talk, you talk it through. You talk through the sizes and what, what's going on there. So that's you know, it's uh, USA Custom. Pretty, uh, the toms are pretty identical dimensions to the kit uh, Dad used to use. So it's an eight, 10, 12, 15, 16, and eighteen. Now the depths and stuff, it's kind of like I'm gonna have to read back up on what those are because it came to the point where I it's was available just like, online to read. I mean, yeah. you know what? That looks like a great kit, a fun kit to play. How tall are you, Nick? I'm about six, six foot, six foot one. 
Um, right, okay. Because so, I'm just looking at that, thinking I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to reach the ragtop. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, that was one thing that I, I was kind of. I, well, the kick on that one is a 22, which is why I spoke about using a 22 for Genesis as opposed to the 20. Um, oh yeah, yeah. With my dad's stuff, but really with those rack toms, it was it, it, it. It's such a vital part of that drum sound that I went. Maybe this is not exactly how I would set it up if I, you know, like the kit that I have with my band is a completely different setup. But I was going to ask you that. What what are you using with your band then? What's the difference? So my band is a double headed kit, and you know, okay. much bigger drums and a much more kind of bottom style setup. You know, a bunch of cymbals and you know stuff to make uh, life fun. It's a I think the concert toms go from being a, um, I think that's a 10 by eight and a, no, eight by eight and you've a got 10 bo- by You've got 12. bottom heads on this kit as well, bottom heads. I should yeah. Say. And then 14, 16, 18 uh, uh, toms with a 24 inch kick, 18 by 24. And right. that, you know, it, it's a much more kind of, I, I felt like with my band, you know, the drums are a, a lot more deep. A lot yeah, more, I can hear um, that on, on the on the recording. If anybody, anyone's listening, go and check out Better Strangers because you can hear the kit is uh, it's just a different sound. It's yeah, totally different. Thank you, man. Well, What's and, the and, heads on the top? Because the heads look like they're the same as what you use on the Phil Collins tour. So on the on the yeah on that other kit, the Genesis uh, thing right now, I'm using a. It d- depends. Usually, I like to use a diplomat, a Remo diplomat on the the, the highest concert tom because I feel like that just cracks. And is obnoxiously, right. you know, uh, you know, has that sound. But then I use ambassadors with. I think now I'm using clear emperors on the two floor toms, okay? Because um, they're thinner heads. Uh, ambassadors are thin, and they're not the the heads I would use on my kit with my band. But it, they just they they sound so much better with the concert toms than any other head does. Yeah. Um, and then I use a power stroke uh, P4 on the um, on the kick drum. Okay. Um, Actually, on the kick drum that I use for Genesis, it's a smooth white kind of finish, which actually has this really lovely attack warm. and, and warm, warmth to warmth. it. Warmth, yeah, definitely. And, um, but with my band, it, I usually use uh, clear uh, vintage Emperors on pretty much everything, and then Diplomats on the two concert toms, because I want... It's a USA a deep... with your, your band as well, right? Yeah, both USA right. Customs. Have you tried the Brooklyn or the Broadcasters? I, I had a... Uh, was it a Broadcaster? Yeah, I, I think I had a Broadcaster before... And it, I loved it. it. It was this beautiful um, natural wood finish, and but obviously I just kind of wanted bigger drums. I wanted it instead of a twelve. Yeah, inch yeah, rack the USA I kits are. I mean, they, they're ridiculous. Uh, but I just found with some of the music I was doing, the broadcaster was great. Uh, it's great on the James Blunt tour because it's warm and round and a real earthy sound. And the Brooklyn just sings a little bit with a bigger band. The drums just just ring out a bit more, and I found mm-hmm. it really easy to tune. So they they all have their place. I mean, I even used I used the new classic with feeder when I first started with feeder. Really, way back, yeah. And that was that was a loud kit, really loud, great sort of rock kit. So I, I've tried pretty much everything. I even had a renown, which sounds great. But you know, as as you as the years go by, you get more spoiled. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> you really do. Right. And you know what? You know what? Uh, you know what works for you. If you like, my my setups, I think are going to flash up somewhere. I just don't know. Okay, so that is a that's actually the broadcaster. That was so I, I'm using the Brooklyn now, but this was the broadcaster that I had, and on this kit we've got. So there we go behind Andrew. Very kindly made me this. Uh, Paul got me this gong drum. Now let me talk you through. So on the left, the snare is a hammer uh, brass, a chrome over brass, fourteen by five and a half, I think that is. And then the main snare there is a brass, another hammered brass. Now they've got different heads on them. So I was using a Emperor X on the main snare, and on the left one there was a P. Th- um, it was a let me think, let me think. It was a p- Power Stroke 4, I think it was. So that was just to have different sounds. Then the the uh, the Rack Tom is a 13. Um, I've tried a 12, but it just looks tiny on that kit. And so I was thinking about trying 12, 13, but I just, I've just got so used to having the one. Right, the kicks there are 22, 24. Floor Toms are 16, 18. And the Gong Drum is a 20. 
So uh, it's, it's quite a setup. Let me just say that cushion. I, I was about uh, to say that you're not talking about the cushion. That's the best part of the drum set. <laughs> the, the, the cushion I acquired from the wardrobe department, for, and it just I seen it lying there, and I thought it really goes with the kit. So I just took a photo. But I've never That's actually funny. sat on it because it's it's sequins. It'd be very yeah. uh, it wouldn't be very nice. Then I think I don't know if we've got another. Have we got another picture to come up? My other setup on. I'm not sure if we have another picture of the James setup. But on the James gig, basically I use. Uh, I'm now using the same rig, basically, I'm, uh, but uh, I don't have as many cymbals, basically. So it's uh, a th I'm actually using a 13 snare, the six and a half, which is gorgeous mm -hmm. uh, for just different sounds. And the main snare on that is a broadcaster snare. It's actually the yellow one off that kit um, as the main. And then I've got 13 and a 16, no, no second floor, but I do have the 22 and 24 kicks. Still, I've just got so, I'll tell you what it is, I've got so used to the layout of the mm -hmm. kit uh, and where the pedals go and just all the places, it's a bit like driving a car and just being used yeah. to where you're at. So, and I utilize it so it works, um, it works very well. But um, yeah, if I, I guess if I'm going into the studio to do something, it's one up, one down, it's a four piece mm -hmm. kit for me because the, the things I get called for uh, mainly uh, song song drumming, to be honest. Yeah. If it's feeder, then a second floor always comes out, and and that's probably the yeah. extent the extent of it for me. The, I think the biggest challenge I had to change my sound was the Robbie Swing Tour because I'm not known for being a, a jazz or a swing drum by any means, and um, I'm, I'm I'm an ear player. I'm not a reader, but I like to listen and, and absorb it and use my muscle memory. So I bought. Um, I got say bought. I, I I acquired off Gretsch the, um, the the Brooklyn for the first time in an off white collar, and uh, I used it for the swing tour and it was great. But I really had to change the tuning of this kit. I had to really take it way up to what I'm used to. I also moved the bass drum beater so that it was that close to the head and not that far apart, which was actually a very good friend of mine's. It was his, his idea, Steve Sidwell. Bless you, Steve. He said just move the kick because I'm very much a kick heavy player. I lean in. And when he told me that, to move the beta and just you, the, your left foot, the foot hat has got to be driving the, the swing stuff, it just totally changed the balance of my playing and gave me a different understanding. And then playing fills on uh, toms that are a bit more tuned up and a bit more ping pong, jazzy, it, it, it's a diff it gives you a different headspace. So, uh, as I say, all the Gretsch uh, models are out there for a reason and they've all, they've all been utilised very well. Um, we've got... Yeah, that old school Gretsch. Someone just said that old school Gretsch sound. Are you? You? We're obviously both uh, Sabian players as well. I've lost him. I think. We may have lost Nick, or we may have lost me. I'm not sure. I think it's. I think Nick might have frozen. So you stuck with me for a minute. So um, anyone. Anyone that is listening and hasn't tried a Gretsch drum kit out, I would urge you to do so. Um, obviously, is it is it this end? Okay. Well, I hope you can still hear me and uh, everyone that has joined us has been enjoying the chat. I can talk about Nick now. He's uh, now he's frozen. But on the on the live show, I went to see him play. I can honestly say, from my experience as a young drummer, I felt the pressures and the the nerve-wracking moments of being being up there on the pedal stall and um, being thrown in the deep end, if you like. And uh, what a head start Nick's had in, in his drum career. And uh, I remember some of the guys in Phil's, but Lee Sklar telling me what a wonderful job he'd done. And uh, if you haven't seen the show, I highly recommend you go and see it because um, I can't imagine. I mean, it. I can't imagine filling that drum chair with ha having one of the best drummers the UK has produced in front of you singing every night. So yeah, incredible. Have we have we got any uh, whilst we're whilst we're waiting for Nick to get back? Do we have any questions that are going to pop up on the left? If you've got any questions, you can fire them into me now. Here we go. We've got one from text. Do you guys have the same text on each artist you're working for? So. Uh, no is the answer uh, for me. Uh, I can't speak for Nick, but, um, you know, some, some drummers over the years have had their own text. But if you think about it, if you're moving around different artists, it's uh, sometimes you go into another camp where they've got another production team. So um, for me personally, I have a guy on James Blunt 
called Hamish, who's fantastic. He's got to know me very well. It's a hard job being a tech because they get to know your your quirks and your um, OCD things, that, you know, silly, silly little quirks that we have as drummers that where you like things placed, you like things, um, your drum keys, certain places, your sticks, your water, whatnot. So um, the guys that work, work for me as techs, Clint is my tech and Robbie, they know me well. And what I love about a good drum tech is they, they, do, they work for you and they, they make the kit a really nice environment that's ready to go. And you, they, you feel like they've got your back when you're up there playing in front of a lot of people. If anything does go wrong, they're there for you. And uh, when all is said and done, it's nice to be able to go for a, a pint with your tech and really get on as well. I think it's important to have a, a relationship with your tech and make them appreciated for one. Because having a tech is a luxury, by the way. Turning up to a gig... And just going on and playing the drums and sound checking and not having to touch anything is is an absolute luxury. It really is. And I, listen, I've I've done my done my time and driving around, loading kits in and out of cars, and I'll do it again if I have to. But it is a luxury, and I I think if you have a tech, it's got to be appreciated. But I hope that answers your question. Does anyone else want to pop a question up? Feel free. Whilst we're waiting for Nick to come back, I hope he's all right. Do we have any more questions to pop up? Oh, Nick is back. Okay, so Nick's going to come back in. Am I? Am I? I saw what, what happened. It wasn't the. I think oh. it was just my computer just gave out. Don't worry. I think you should have heard what I said about you. It was all. It was. Te- it was great. <laughs> no, oh, it's someone weird. just asked. Ashley, someone was just asking, so I can we can catch up um, about techs on gigs. So I'm guessing. Um, well, you can tell me. Do I was just asked if I have different techs on different gigs or the same guy. Have you got the same drum tech going across the Genesis as you had on the Phil Collins tour? Yeah, uh, a long time tech. Um, he's his his name is uh, Brad Marsh. I mean, we all call him Munchie. Um, Munchie. Why his, why is he called Munchie? I it's it, that's a story that happened long before my time. You know, okay. he's been he's been uh, part of the crew since I think 1990. He must be good. He must be top end. I mean. There's a lot of great techs out there. There's uh, guys that I've had Depp on, Robbie, a um, guy called Yard who's fantastic. Got, there's lot, lot, lots of great techs in the business. And I think I love the loyalty card. If he's been on the gig all that time and he's mm-hmm. gone across to Genesis with you, he must be, yeah. lo- he must be a great guy. He's great. And honestly, the, the thing that I really loved about having him, there are two things. The first thing was you know, the, his approach towards the concert tom kit is, right. is, is really great and something that – him being able to tune that to perfection the way he does really makes my job a lot easier. Yeah. But then also, t- sorry. Sorry, mate. You know, you carry on. And I was saying, and also just him being, uh, you know, it, part of the crew for so long, you know, yeah. he actually can give me some insight as to certain parts that I didn't really, you that's know, there was a like, great, that's a great thing to say. Really. That is true. There was one, you know, was, uh, on Domino by Genesis, there was this um, on, on the live version Chester used to go into this crazy double pedal thing, but to me, I just kind of heard more of a kind of triplet, like a Bonham kind of triplet, like, you know, yeah, yeah. and so, but then when I went to it and, you know, I'm, I'm a really, very much a, a single kick guy, you know, I'm not huge on double kick just because it's just not, you know, not my thing. Do you have a double um, pedal on the gig? Uh, on the Genesis gig, I do because of this one part of the song where he goes, "You got to do the double pedal, man." And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be the guy who's not gonna do the double pedal. At, no, at, no, at no. Point. And people, you know, people are gonna want to hear that part. Exactly. So, kind of... so you know, now, now I have to, I do that, and, and and you know, him being able to kind of give the um, the right, you know, the right advice and the right kind of just stuff of making sure everything's there and the way it should sound, you know, when, yeah. especially when it comes to triggers. I mean, the amount of triggers we have on the Genesis uh, is, <laughs> is crazy. Yeah, you know, you I, know, I was listening to some Genesis today in the car and I was thinking, Christ, um, I don't know how, I, I don't know what you must be, you must be using triggers because there's a lot of different drum sounds from song to song. Yeah, we run a lot of stuff through a, a Roland, um, a Roland kind of trick, actually two trigger systems because there's so many drums, we have to use two. Right. Um, you know, different songs, obviously a lot of the songs, you know, the progier stuff, we just use the regular, you know, uh, drum kit sound, but there's certain songs like mama, um, you know, that have a real kind of hardcore gated, uh, vibe to it. And then obviously songs like home by the sea and domino, which are like all Simmons from that era of, you know, of, of drumming. How many songs have you had to learn for this tour so far? Honestly, it, it, it the Genesis stuff, it started learning. I probably learned about 40 songs. And right. then that got, you know, slimmed down to the amount that we have 
now. You've got to see what works in rehearsal. I mean, I was only talking to, to Robbie about his hits. He's got so many to choose from. And uh, doing a set list for a band like Genesis must be the, one of the toughest things, which I guess mm -hmm. until, you, until you get in there... Until you get in there and start playing stuff, I think it's uh, it's difficult to know what's going to work. Someone's just asking, uh, what's both of your favourite Genesis song? That's a tough question. I mean, today, I mean, I, I don't know if you've played this one. I was listening to uh, Jesus, He Knows It. Yeah. Have you, pl have you played that yeah. one? Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that was one of the <laughs> ones. It's such a great track. Um, I don't know. There's, there's, there's so many to choose from. Yeah, Land, of, Land of Confusion's great, of course. Um, yeah. But there's some deeper stuff that people from albums. I mean, what, what's your favorite that you've played so far? Is the I honestly, one that, and, there's kind of different views I have. I mean, there's the, there's my favorite songs and my favorite ones to play. Um, right. Because honestly, I, I really enjoy playing some of the songs that don't have a lot of drumming. Songs like uh, Carpet Crawlers and and uh, Hold On My Heart. But then Listen there's to that today. But then there's obviously the more proggy stuff that I love. You know, the the musical piece of Cinema Show in the cage and even <laughs> even the back half you know apocalypse and nine eight from supper's ready i mean those are some have you learned all this by ear have you scribbled it have you done cheat sheets yeah well i i, I all of it was by ear apart from when i had to learn uh bits of um i can't say which song now because if we don't do it on the tour i'm, we're, I'm gonna feel the wrath of the genesis <laughs> fans no well listen but i'm i'm um i'm really pleased to hear that you've done it by ear because it shows um sign of an amazing musician with a great muscle memory and i think it, you, it, it will go in and um, you'll play from the heart. It's it, it's incredibly it, listening to the stuff. It's incredibly complex to what you've had to learn, and I, yeah, I, I personally you. can't wait to come and see. It. That, that was one thing that to me it was like so important to do that was because of where you know where my dad's headspace was when he wrote the drum parts. I mean, he's like you know he's he's a he doesn't really he doesn't read music, and he's a much more kind of ear feel based guy. So yeah. I felt like learning the songs that way just made more sense obviously i'm not a big uh music reader either but so it was much more fun for me to just learn it the way that i heard it and yeah. just memorizing the song let it go in yeah do you know i i must tell you this because i don't i haven't a chance to tell you i met your dad once and i don't know if you remember but anyway uh, the way it came about we were all in germany to do a show called wet and das and robbie was on the show and your dad was on the show and uh the show was called off for a, a very uh, a tragic tragedy that happened on set because it's a live transmission. So I went back to the hotel and the, 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 late, the record label boss said to me, come upstairs, I've got someone for you to meet. So I went upstairs, sat down, met Phil and had a whiskey sour. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. But that was because I was really gutted that we weren't doing the show. But um, I then couldn't sleep because I just met one of the best drummers. <laughs> it's amazing. So what's uh, what's the plans for now? As it stands, the tour will be when? September? Yeah, uh, September we're doing the UK and, you know, I, I've fingers crossed that that is possible. And God, that, I really hope so because it's, it, you know, for all musicians out there at the minute, it's really, it's a terribly tough time and the, the, the goalposts keep moving, if you like. It's, it's oh, really hard not, not knowing what's on the horizon and if even if gigs gigs will come back and we'll be able to have the crowd set out the way they are i don't know if it's going to be mm -hmm. a, a different setup what, or what. what about on your end you had mentioned that james blunt had some had some dates yeah i mean they're still online there's a there's a tour that was sold the tickets were sold so we, our tour stopped in um it stopped in germany and all the tickets were sold so the tickets are still sold and that's always kind of moved a couple of times but there's an a uk arena tour in for may which i think is probably about a bit ambitious but nobody's written it off yet so um mm. when this new lockdown comes to an end maybe there'll be a bit of light at the end of the tunnel it's hard to know but um i think everyone's got, you've got to try and be positive and doing things like this is is great i mean i haven't done a lot of these but this has been really well set up by Gretch. I think it's a great thing. We'd never have done this, Nick. I don't think we'd have had this conversation no, if absolutely. it weren't for, for the, the lockdown thing. So I think there's a lot, there's, there's positives that have definitely come out of it. Um, for sure. And I think, I think for me, I, I'll always, I'll, I will be, I'll remain positive, but um, I, I personally think the tour that you've got in September is more of a realistic uh, it's got more chance of that happening at that point in this year. I can't see anything happening this summer, but I don't want to be too negative because this has been fantastic, by the way. Mm -hmm. This has been no, this really has been great. awesome. I've had a great time. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I actually realized it was my computer was about to die of battery because the, the outlet I was plugged into wasn't working. 
Don't so worry. I plug in a new outlet and now we're, we're all right. <laughs> Your studio looks better than mine. <laughs> Actually, I must, I must thank my good friend, Sean. This is Sh Sean's studio and he's, he's, he's set it up wonderfully. I, ha I watched a few of the Greatest Generations um, episodes and they're, they're great. Matt Solms was fantastic. And uh, Dave, uh, Dave, sorry, um, Ash Shone and uh, Stanton did one. Bless Stanton, he's got a great studio, but the internet went down. But the way they dealt with it was brilliant. Ash got his phone out and they were talking to each other via phone. So these things happen. It's all good. Yeah. It's, it's all good. I think, if I'm not wrong in saying, we're going to head into a final wrap and some, and some banners. So I'd like to say to Gretch, Fred Gretch, Andrew, um, Dave Phillips, Jules, everybody, Paul Cooper, everyone at the, at the Gretch for, for looking after us and bringing me and Nick together because he's a new friend and he's a legend. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. And, and you know, it's been great. And honestly, uh, having a, a lot of the times you have, you know, people have conversations and it's just, but we, I really enjoyed it. And, me you too. know, it's been a really good time. And, and yeah, thanks to Gretch for putting this together. I mean, it was, it was something that, you know, I think was, it was kind of came about relatively quickly on my end. So I would, you know, stoked to be here and I really enjoyed it. So, and you know, thanks it's been for everybody fantastic. Who, who joined. And, uh, I'll come and see you play if that tours on, hopefully. But you're, you're an astonishing young talent, so uh, keep it up and stay in touch. And thanks to everyone that tuned in today. It's been Absolutely. a joy. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys.